Welcome back to another Construct Free video. Now, anyone who's used Construct Free before knows that behaviors are a huge part of the Construct engine and do a lot of the hard work for you. Today, I want to go through and explain every single one, how they can be used, and how they work. Let's get started. First behavior that we've got is jump through. When jumping on a platform, we can go through it and we land on top. Really, really great and crucial for platform games. Now with a bit of code at the bottom, if I hold down, I'll fall right through it. Next one we've got is called no safe. So what I'm gonna do is I've got my two cubes here. I'm going to move them a little bit and I'm gonna press S. This will now save the game. I'm now gonna move, I'm gonna load. Now my purple cube has got the no save behavior on. So when I load, it'll be the only thing that doesn't save. Really, really handy. If you want to save just the key elements of the game, you don't want to save everything like all the enemies, which will add to the file size. Persist is a really, really interesting one. I've got two platforms here. The top platform has got the persist behavior on. Now when I restart the level, the top platform will stay exactly where it is and will keep moving, while everything else in the level will reset itself. Really, really handy if you've got something that you don't want to restart the level, maybe a boss that when you die and you go back to the checkpoint, you've got another chance to take it on again. Shadow caster allows us to cast shadows. Now you have to add the light object and this will be invisible once you play the game. I've just added an icon similar just to show you what happens. So you can pin this to your player using the code below. But again, on its own, the light object is invisible but it does draw and cast light, which then casts shadows on anything that's got the shadow caster behavior. Solid object is one of the tried and trues of construct. It's really, really important and is used in nearly every single game. I've got a platform character that can move and bounce off any of the solid stuff. It can't get through whatsoever. And on the right side, I've got eight directions and it's stuck in this box because all the walls are solid. The anchor behavior allows you to anchor stuff to the viewpoint or the camera. So as I leave this part of the level, the anchor will stay inside the top area and not leave the screen. Now I find this is a little bit buggy sometimes. You see it's jarring and jumping around, but it has got some really useful uses. So if you want to create a quick UI, anchor is the behavior to use. Bounce layout means that an object cannot leave the layout. Now that's different to the viewpoint, the viewpoint being the camera, layout being the page. So you can't go off the page or off the level. So I've got the purple cube that's got the bounce layout property on, why the left cube has not. So if we try and leave, you'll see the purple cube stay where it is, while the pink cube leaves. And if I go the other way, purple cube stays, pink cube is allowed to leave. Destroy outside of layout is another one that's really, really useful, especially for quick respawn systems. So the purple cube has got this behavior on, and if it leaves the layout for any reason, this is really handy if it falls off a map and dies, then it is destroyed. So you see my pink cube comes back, my purple one doesn't, and then the level's restarted because my pink cube's destroyed. Same again. Purple one's gone, pink one is still alive. Drag and drop allows us to take our mouse, pick up objects and move them around the screen. Combine this with the physics behavior, which we'll look at later, allows those objects to drop once we let go of them. Really, really handy stuff. Lots and lots of uses, especially in puzzle games. The fade behavior allows an object to fade from opaque to transparent, and you can even make it so once it's fade, it's destroyed. Using the code below, I've made a secret wall that when I approach it, it fades and it disappears and now it's gone. The flash behavior causes an object to flash on and off for a set amount of time. Now we can use this inside our code to check if an object's flashing and I'm using this below here to create an invulnerability system. So if I land on this spike, I take damage and I can't take any more damage until I stop flashing. So you'll see my health has gone down to two. I can stand there and it just gives me that little bit of time to get away. Line of sight, we can add to enemies or to other objects. And what we do is we set up a value to them. In this case, I've set up fringe pixels. 
And if I get between 300 pixels of this object, it will start chasing me. Now, line of sight doesn't work through solid walls unless we turn that option off, which means I can use this to hide behind solid walls. And again, if I get too far away from my enemy, it loses line of sight. Now, obviously, the code below is allowing the enemy to follow me. The line of sight behavior on its own does not allow an enemy to follow you or just chase you. So you've got to add a little bit of extra work onto this behavior. Pin is a really useful one. It allows us to pin one object onto another. So in this case, on the start of layout, I'm pinning both a hat and I'm pinning the health bar. So as my player moves around the screen, both those two objects stay with my player at all times. Really, really useful stuff. Scroll to is one of these other ones that you use straight away and it basically allows the camera to follow an object. So as I move up the level, the camera goes with it. If you've got scroll to on multiple objects, it will take the center point between those objects and that'll be the scroll to. We can also use the code at the bottom to use a screen shaking effect. So if I hit the spike, the screen will shake. And you can change how big or dramatic the shake is. The timer effect is really, really useful. When an action is started, you can actually run a timer in the background. And if that timer is running, you can stop other stuff from happening or you can see how far that timer is in. So anything that needs time based stuff, stuff like cooldowns, really, really useful. In this case, I'm going to use space to flip gravity and then I'll the keyboard and I won't be able to flip back until five seconds have passed. So I'm hitting the keyboards lots and lots of times, three, four and five. Now I'm allowed to flip back to gravity. So again, I can't do anything. Five seconds has passed. I'm now allowed to go. The tween option allows you to move from one position to the other or move an object from one position to the other. And instead of teleporting them there, it will actually show an animation between there. So we can have an object slowly move from one position to the other, or we can also use this to combine two abilities. So in this case, I'm moving my X position by 300 in 0.1 seconds when the space bar is pressed, like so. But I'm not just teleporting across, I'm actually moving and animating across. So a nice little ability there. And again, tween is just letting us animate from one place to the other. Wrap allows us to go off the screen and appear on the other side. Now this does not work for viewpoints, so the camera, this works for layout. So I've had to make my layout smaller for this, but when I leave my layout, I'll just appear on the other side. Really, really handy for old style arcade games. Eight direction is one that you'll be quite familiar with or might have used a lot. There's lots of properties that we can use around eight directions. So my first one on the left hand side is up and down. So it's only going to move up and down. I can't move left and right whatsoever. So if you think it's not like a pong paddle, it's be really useful. Left and right does the same thing. It's only moving left and right. It cannot move up or down. Four directions will mean we can move up, down, left and right. But if we compare this to our eight directions, we cannot move diagonal like it can. And then finally, we've got our two different types of eight directions. One of them has got no turn on, which means it does not turn around and it just stays exactly where it is. Bullet allows us to spawn a bullet that shoots across the screen. Now the code below is actually spawning the bullet and all the bullet does is travel in a certain angle or certain distance at a certain speed. So that can all be adjusted in the properties for the bullet itself. And one of the other things that we can add is bounce off solids, which means that the object will keep bouncing off solid objects. We can even control how many times it's allowed to bounce before it's destroyed. The car behavior allows us to add the car behavior to a uh, object and this behaves like we'd expect a car to. So we can accelerate and we get faster and faster. We can break, which takes some time to do, reverse, and we can turn and we can even drift. So if you're creating any sort of racing game, start with this behavior, it'll do a lot of the hard work for you. Custom behavior allows us to set up more and more advanced behaviors. So if you're doing something quite niche and the normal behaviors don't fit into what we want, there's lots of options we can use here. So very, very simple bit of code here just means that the block accelerates towards my cube, keeps up momentum and then turns around. But lots and lots of options to play around with. So if you're creating something that is outside the bounds of the normal behaviors, custom behavior is the one to use. The move to behavior allows an object to move towards a certain point or another object. In this case, I'm moving an enemy to my player, and I'll just keep following it. Now, 
you might be thinking this is a really really clever enemy, uh, enemy AI but this will get stuck on walls it will try and get through the walls and it won't be able to so it does have its limits orbit allows an object to orbit around a point we can choose how far it's allowed to orbit in the x direction and the y and how fast it moves combine this with solid this works really really great for platform levels and we can also turn on the rotate function so as it turns it also rotates just as the example is on the right hand side pathfinding is really really great for enemies and it allows an enemy to pathfind towards us so playing that one again the enemy first looks for a path i'm setting this for three seconds because it's quite a difficult path for it to find and once that path is found it's going to move across it so if you're creating a game like dungeons and you want an enemy to try and find the player pathfinding is vital really really great for any enemies physics is one of my favorite behaviors and it allows us to move objects using gravity and they'll interact with any other object that's got the physics on as well we can make objects heavier we can have them more denser bouncier and we can create some really really clever stuff with this works really well with puzzle games any physics based games especially mobile games works really really well one to really play around with but again make sure every object you want it to interact with so that's any platforms any walls also have the physics behavior on if not it won't work platform behavior we've looked at this quite a lot in this video already but this allows us to create a simple platform game now there's lots and lots of behaviors that we can add for example we can double jump we can also add something called jump sustain which means that when we jump when we tap jump we get a different height as opposed to hold jump which allows us to jump that a little bit higher lots of settings to play around with this one really really great behavior does a lot of the hard work if you're creating a platform game the rotate behavior allows an object to rotate now this can be used in many many different ways in this example here i'm using it to just rotate these physics walls around just like so uh, other practical uses that we can use for it we can use it as a hazard that tries to spin towards us and we have to try and avoid it or as another challenge or platform in a platformer game the sign behavior now this one looks quite complicated but it's a very very powerful one and one to definitely play around with it allows us to create moving platforms these work great inside a platform game or they can be used as walls or obstacles in a top-down game now the top one is our default as we set it up and it's a platform moving back and forth in some of our property options we've got something called a period offset and this is what delay it is to the other platforms so i've set this to half the time of the default one which means the platform can move on opposites to each other there's a property called magnitude and this is the distance it's going to move so a lower magnitude will move less distance there's different ways we can move the platform so sawtooth will move all the way to the right hand side and then it will teleport to the back the reverse sawtooth will do the opposite square will just teleport between the two different options back and forth and we can also do up and down and if we do a shorter period it will move faster because period is how long it takes to run through the full cycle so the shorter the period the faster it's running through that cycle there's many many more options with this i cannot fit onto one screen such as making a platform grow bigger and smaller in size making it bigger and smaller in width one to definitely play around with and have a bit of fun with tile movement allows our player or object to move on a square tile so a lot of old games use this quite a lot where instead of allowing the player to move freely they can only move on square tiles so as i move i'm staying inside a 32 by 32 grid and i can adjust this grid size to be bigger and smaller depending on what i want my game to be on the right hand side you see that i've got the same thing again but my player is moving down a diagonal this is called an isometric tile grid and this is just a uh, tick box that you can check so if you want to create yourself an isometrical game this is the behavior to add Finally, we've got turret. Now, turret uses a bit of code to get started on it. So, on start of layout, we add our targets and then we get the turret to shoot. And we want the on shoot method when spawning the bullets because that way it works with all the properties we're using as well. So, first turret on the left hand side, it will turn, it will shoot, and it will try and aim for me. So, really, really perfect for a tower defense. Now you'll see that I'm able to dodge these bullets quite easily by just moving back and forth or just staying ahead of the turret. 
The second turret has got smart shooting on as a tick box aim. So you notice as, as I move, it's trying to predict where I am and every single time it's actually shooting me, unlike that first turret. So that's another option that you can play around with. If you're creating a tower defense, again, this is the perfect behavior just for you. So thank you very much. Hopefully you've learned a bit more about the behaviors that are inside of Construct. Hope you've learned something new. I know I've learned quite a lot actually just making this video. This video has took me a long, long time to make compared to my others. So if you can like and comment, that would be fantastic. And let me know what your favorite behaviors are of all the amazing ones inside of Construct 3.